Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining our Low Lab update today. It's brilliant to see so many of you on the call. I think we've got about 320 people signed up for today, which is just crazy. So for those of you that joined early, well done, <laughs> in case we have any problems with the system. Um, so today, uh, the purpose of the session today is the kind of update that we do every couple of months on various cases and developments in employment law. But also, I'm delighted to be joined today by my very glamorous assistant, Mr. Morgan. Do you want to say hello, David? Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, David is going to do a session today on ton, ton, to, 10 top tips <laughs> on mediation. Um, and David, I did mean to check in with you so that I could do a proper introduction about how amazing you are and how involved you are in mediation, and I forgot to do that. So I'll let you provide everyone with details of your experience on mediation when it comes to your section, if that's okay. I'll let you uh, put yourself fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we're going to cover today, I'm going to start off just by doing, as I say, a bit of a case update. I've got three cases um, to share with you today. Two of them are on discrimination. One is on employment tribunal procedure. Um, and then I'll do a little section on what's in the news um, and then hand over to David on mediation. We're recording the session today, so if you miss any of it or there's any technical problems, don't worry, we will share the recording with you after the session. Um, and as I'm sure many of you will be bored of hearing us say, if we can ask if you can all just remain on mute throughout the session, that would be brilliant just to limit the background noise. If you do have any questions, please do just type them into the chat box. We're really keen to pick those up and answer as many of them as we can for you. Um, I've got to do the lawyer bit, of course, and say we can't give specific advice on specific circumstances on this call. We can only offer you general advice, but as always, if you need any further help, you can just pick up with any member of the team. Um, so without further ado, let's get launched into the first case for today. Um, I'm going to cover the two discrimination ones first. The first case is about the issue of gender fluid and non-binary employees. And the reason we're covering this case is it's the first time this topic's been considered in employment tribunal. And so it's quite an interesting one to, to uh, share with you. The name of the case itself is Taylor against Jaguar Land Rover. And I should say as well, we'll be issuing the law lab in written form next Monday. So you'll get details of all the case names and, and information when we uh, circulate that as well. So um, first case, Taylor against Jaguar Land, and, uh, Jaguar Land Rover. Facts of this case is it involves an engineer. He had worked with Jaguar Land Rover for over 20 years. Um, and in 2017, he disclosed to his employer that he wished to be identified as gender fluid and non-binary. Um, he told his employer that's how he wanted to be treated going forward and he started to dress in women's clothing at work. So um, you can imagine what flowed from that in terms of jokes being made at his expense, insults, etc., um, which caused him a great deal of concern. He also had issues when it came to toilet facilities and which toilets he should use. And um, I think a number of colleagues challenged um, that side of things for him as well. So he found things very difficult and he also alleged that there was a real lack of managerial support in the circumstances. So he felt by 2018 that given everything that had happened, he really had no option but to resign. So resigned his employment um, and he raised claims against his employer for constructive unfair dismissal, harassment, direct discrimination and also victimisation. And the kind of key issue in that case then for the tribunal to decide was whether or not somebody who identified as gender fluid and non-binary actually had one of the protected characteristics under the Equality Act 2010. And what the claimant sought to argue was that the protected characteristic under the Act for him was um, a gender reassignment. So you'll know that gender reassignment is one of the protected characteristics when it comes to discrimination claims. Now, what his employer argued was if someone identifies as gender fluid or non-binary, that doesn't fall within the definition of gender reassignment because gender reassignment is all about somebody transitioning from one sex to the other. So from male to female, female to male. Whereas in this case, the individual wasn't transitioning from one sex to another. Um, what he was seeing is his gender was fluid, it was non-binary. Um, so the argument that was run by the employer was, well, that doesn't fall into the definition of gender reassignment and therefore you can't be protected under the legislation. Um, so 
as I say, the case is an interesting one because it's the first time this issue has actually be con been considered in tribunal. And what the tribunal said was, well, actually, when you look at it, gender is a spectrum. Um, and in their view, they said it was beyond any doubt that the claimant was protected under the gender reassignment provision. So their view was, although the claimant in this situation wasn't going through gender reassignment as a process, um, the fact that the discrimination was based on his gender because of his desire to be identified as gender fluid and non-binary was enough for him to fall under that protected characteristic. And therefore, he could pursue a claim for discrimination on the grounds of gender reassignment. Um, so I guess just a couple of points on that. It, it really, I suppose what it does is it really highlights the development of the law in this area. Those of you that are involved in kind of DNI um, projects will be very aware that the whole issue of gender fluidity um, and, and non-binary is very, very topical. And I guess it's just to say to you, you know, if you're involved in reviewing policies, etc., it's absolutely something to have at the forefront of your mind when you're working in the DNI uh, area. Um, and also, I guess, to think about it in terms of can you be doing anything proactive now to manage potential situations in the future? If you do have staff that identify as gender fluid or non-binary, I always think it's a lot easier to start to address those issues now than get yourself into a situation where you know, you've not educated staff, you've not uh, changed your policy at all, and you only do it in reaction to someone who does say, I want to identify as, as gender fluid and non-binary, because it absolutely shines the light on, on that individual. So um, just something to think about if it's not already covered off in your policies. Um, so that's the first case. The second case on discrimination, um, I really enjoyed reading about this case, is uh, the question of um, whether or not something is capable of being viewed as a philosophical belief. Now, I imagine most of you haven't had to deal with the situation of an individual claiming that they have a philosophical belief and they've been discriminated on that basis so far in the workplace. We haven't seen a huge amount of those cases um, coming through, particularly in Scotland. I think we do see more of them uh, through our clients that we act for through the, the rest of the UK, particularly in England. You, there's maybe they're maybe a bit more common than they have been in Scotland. But um, it's interesting to see the approach that the tribunal has taken. We are starting to see more claims coming through and really stretching the boundaries of well, what actually qualifies as a philosophical belief. And you'll have seen, was it maybe about three or four months ago, we had the various cases on um, whether someone who's vegetarian, whether that would qualify as a philosophical belief. The view on that from the tribunal was no, they, on the basis that it was a, a lifestyle choice rather than a, a belief. But then we had the subsequent case on whether someone who is vegan would be a philosophical belief. And the view on that one was yes, they would. So we're definitely starting to see a trend of these cases coming through. Anyway, this case is a, a really interesting one. Sorry, I know I start all the cases with this case is a really interesting one. But this case is another really interesting one. Um, it's the case of Jackson against Liddell. So what happened in this case was um, it had an employee, Mr. Jackson, who I, I assume had under two years service. He may have had more, but um, I'm assuming it's under two years service and that's why he sought the discrimination claim. Um, he was dismissed for saying something which was viewed as very offensive, um, where he said that, a uh, strange phrase to use, but he said Asians are greasy. And on the back of him making that statement in the workplace, um, he was taken through a um, disciplinary process uh, and he was asked to apologise because if he would, if he apologised as part of the process, then that is something that can be taken into account and decide what action to take. But Mr Jackson refused to apologise. And he said the reason that he refused to apologise was because he had a core belief in stoicism. Now, I have to confess, when I looked at this case, I then had to Google in my detailed research what the legal definition of stoicism is. And yeah, I had to say I assume stoicism is all about somebody who's kind of, I suppose, very strong in their views or, or or holds a particular view and isn't prepared to change them. But according to, and I think I was kind of along the, the right lines, according to Wikipedia, um, it's a school of philosophy founded in Athens in the third century BC. So, um, Apparently, the, the kind of belief of stoicism is the path to happiness is found in accepting the moment, not being controlled by the desire for pleasure or fear of pain, and using your mind to understand the world, 
to do your part in nature's plan and also interestingly to work together and treat others fairly and justly um which doesn't seem to fit with the statement that was made by by mr jackson however there you go that's apparently the definition of stoicism so what he said was the reason that he refused to apologize was because it was important to him to be true and not to be concerned with the consequences of what he said. And that was a demonstration of his belief in stoicism. And he was bringing a claim for indirect, and that's quite important, indirect discrimination on the grounds of his philosophical belief. So the issue, of course, for the tribunal was, well, is stoicism a philosophical belief or not under the Equality Act? Um, and I, I think these cases are very interesting because when um, discrimination on the grounds of philosophical belief was first introduced, what the legislation referred to was um, discrimination on the grounds of religion or similar philosophical belief. So the idea was for something to qualify as a philosophical belief, it had to be similar to a religion. That was then challenged in subsequent cases on the basis that it didn't properly implement um, the European legislation on discrimination on the grounds of philosophical belief. And what the European Court said was for something to be a philosophical belief, it doesn't have to be similar to a religion. So that um, reference to similar was, was dropped, which of course then had the effect of broadening the definition of a philosophical belief potentially. So what the tribunal did in this case is they looked at the five factors that are set down in the Granger case, which is kind of the key case when you're looking at philosophical belief. Um, many of you I'm sure will be familiar with the five factors. So the first fact that the tribunal looks at is, is the belief genuinely held? The second one is that the tribunal has to be satisfied that it's a belief and it's not just an opinion. So it has to be more than, than just somebody's opinion. Um, it has to relate to a weighty and substantial aspect of human behavior. The fourth one is it has to be worthy of respect in a democratic society. And the fifth one is it has to be compatible with human dignity and not conflict with the fundamental rights of others. So that's your five factors when you're looking at philosophical belief. Um, so in relation to the decision, what the tribunal said, and I think it'd be really interesting actually to see the evidence that was led in, the, in this case, but what the tribunal said was based on the evidence, um, they were satisfied that the employee had demonstrated that this was more than just an opinion. This was absolutely a belief that went to the core of who he was. Um, they felt that he had a strong interest in stoicism. They found that this was the only um, kind of moral belief system that he followed. So, you know, he didn't have multiple belief systems. This was the one belief system that absolutely guided the way that he lived his life. Um, and they were of the view that it was, as I say, it was more than an opinion. This was a belief that absolutely went to the core of who he was. So the kind of fifth factor then that became the crux of this case was the question about whether or not his belief was worthy of respect in a democratic society and compatible to human dignity. And of course, the argument that was run by the, empl the employer was, well, what the claimant said in this case was offensive. So surely if you've caused offence to someone as a result of your beliefs, um, that's just not acceptable. And it goes against this fifth factor of being worthy of respect in a democratic society and compatible with, with human dignity. Um, but the tribunal's finding was that stoicism could qualify as a philosophical belief because what they said was stoicism in itself is a, 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 a philosophy, a belief that people choose to follow. Um, there's no fundamental right in society not to be offended. So the fact that um, the claimant's belief led to him to say something that was offensive was not in itself incompatible with the rights and dignity of others. So it's quite an interesting outcome, I think. Um, and I, I suppose just coming back to, I said it was important to note that he was pursuing a claim for indirect discrimination on the grounds of philosophical belief, because I suspect we've not got to the second part of the case yet. All, all the tribunal have dealt with so far is whether or not stoicism is a philosophical belief. I suspect the employer is likely to be in a strong position to argue justification um, in response to the indirect discrimination claim on the basis that they notwithstanding the fact that um, Mr. Jackson's actions were as, were as a result of his philosophical belief, it's not acceptable for comments along that nature to be made within the workplace. So I'm not sure that he'll succeed with the indirect sex, uh, 
discrimination claim on the grounds of philosophical belief, but interesting to see that he has managed to get so far as to get the tribunal to uphold that stoicism is a philosophical belief under the legislation. And again, I think it does just demonstrate how broad an interpretation the tribunals are taking when you're looking at this question of, of philosophical belief. Um, so again, as I say, quite an interesting decision, I think. Um, all right, so third case for today, third and last case, I said I promised you a case on, on tribunal procedure. Um, again, this is another interesting one, I think, just to flag to you in terms of costs. So you'll know that it's very rare for an employment tribunal to award costs against a losing party, which is always something then that you have to weigh up and take into account if you're faced with an employment tribunal claim. Even if you succeed, um, you're very unlikely to be able to recover the costs that you um that you incur as a result of defending the claim, which is unlike court actions where the loser tends to pay. So in the case of Tan against um, Copthorne, this was an interesting case in terms of the tribunal making a decision to award costs and to award quite a significant um, award of costs against the claimant in favour of the employer. Um, so the claimant in this case was a senior vice, print, uh, vice president of a hotel group he was put at risk of redundancy and in response to that he made allegations against his employer um, you'll sometimes hear us talking about uh, kitchen sink claims. This is a kitchen sink claim. You throw everything in. His allegations were for victimisation, discrimination, harassment, whistleblowing and also unlawful deduction of wages. So um, multiple claims submitted to the employment tribunal once he had been made redundant. Um, as part of the disclosure exercise prior to the tribunal hearing taking place, uh, it became apparent that the claimant had been secret secretly recording hundreds of hours of conversations and meetings between himself and his colleagues. So he wasn't just recording meetings that he was sitting in, he was also just recording conversations that he was having one on one with various colleagues. And this had been going on for years, um, which the tribunal decided, described as extremely deceitful. So I think that obviously went against him. Um, but also in addition to that, the hearing itself lasted for seven days. So you can imagine it you know that's a quite a, a lengthy hearing quite an expensive process and um, through the hearing the tribunal gave the claimant an opportunity to withdraw his claims which you think is a very strong indication that the hearing is not going in your favour and um, they also made various orders against him to pay deposits in relation to a number of his claims. So again, a very strong indication that the tribunal were very unlikely to find in his favour. Um, but notwithstanding that, he maintained all of his claims against the company and he insisted that he wanted to carry on with the tribunal process. And you'll not be surprised to hear he lost all of the claims. Um, and one of the things that the tribunal criticised him for was what they described as his scattergun approach, where he basically was looking to bring claims in as many areas as he possibly could. Um, and also really looking to kind of wrongly implicate his colleagues in all of the claims as well. So what became very clear in the evidence was that he was trying to bring other colleagues into it and make assertions against them that just weren't true. So taking all of that into account, um, the tribunal ended up making an award of costs against the claimant of £432,000. So just massive. Um, and I think it's the highest award that the Employment Tribunal have ever made for costs. So I guess just a reminder, you know, that the, the tribunal will award costs where they believe it's justified. And we have a number of cases in the last year, actually, where we've unusually made an application for costs awards against claimants because of the way that they've conducted the litigation. Um, and we have been successful with those applications. So there are circumstances where the tribunal will make the, the award. You do have to be able to demonstrate that there's particular behaviours that are unreasonable that have led to you making that application, but they, they, they will do it. And I suppose it's just to be aware you know, on either side in a tribunal situation, that there is that risk of an award of costs being made against you. And to ensure that if you are going to defend a claim, for example, you do have sufficient evidence to justify your position in the in the defence, because you do run that risk of the potential award if that's not the case. Um, there is also a view at the moment that tribunals may be more minded to award costs because they're dealing with such a backlog in claims. Um, there may be kind of more of a 
I suppose, an incentive to try and discourage claims that shouldn't be going through the system. So um, quite an interesting one, 432,000. Um, obviously, a, a lot of money to be awarded against an individual. So that's your three case updates for today. Um, just a few things very quickly in terms of what's in the news. Um, you'll not have failed to see, I'm sure, the extension of the furlough scheme <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm not going to go into that in any detail. Um, we did do a webinar on the 12th of November and there's a recording of that on our website. So if anybody missed it um, and wants to catch up on what's happening on the furlough scheme, please do um, listen into it. One of the key things to be aware of now is that you have to submit your claim for furlough within 14 days of the end of the month. So it's quite a tight time period. That wasn't the case before. And the other thing just to be aware of is um, it's been made very clear now that if you've issued notice of termination of employment, you can't claim furlough. That's you cannot claim furlough for the, the notice period. So prior to the 1st of December, you could claim furlough once you'd get issued notice to employees. You can no longer do that. So that's quite a change. It's something to be aware of. Um, what else was I going to mention? CIPD and the Equality and Human Rights Commission have recently published a guidance on how to manage and support employees that are suffering from domestic abuse. Um, and steps that employers can take in that situation. Again, it's a very topical subject. You'll again, I've seen various reports about the, the increase in domestic abuse incidents as a result of lockdown. Um, so just to put that on your radar and also that the government have undertaken a review of ways in which employers can support victims of domestic abuse in the workplace, which they are meant to be publishing before the end of the year. So again, just something for you to look out for. Um, I think the anticipation is that there will be some some steps kind of or, or requests put on employers from that point of view. So something to have on your radar. Um, for those of you that are in the public sector, I'm sure you haven't missed this, but um, after much consultation and much discussion, the um, cap on exit payments has been put in place for public sector exits. So that's applied from the 4th of November um, and there's a cap of 95,000 on any exit payments now in the public sector and that applies to the whole of the UK. So something to be aware of. Um, also, I'm sure you'll have seen this, the government published updated immigration rules in anticipation of Brexit, 31st of December. Um, those updated immigration rules came into effect on the 1st of December, so yesterday. Um, if anyone needs any guidance on that, we've obviously got the immigration team here that can, can help out with that. So um, they are the key updates that I just wanted to put on your radar. And with that, I'm going to hand over to David for his top 10 tips on mediation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morag. Um, I hope you can everyone hear me OK. Um, we thumbs up there. Good. So thank you. Yes. Um, so what we're going to look at now is an area of interest of mine, which is mediation. So I did my training in mediation back in 2010. Um, so I kind of turned a corner there. Mediation is and conciliation, I guess, has always been steeped in the system that we are familiar with in employment, not least with ACAS conciliation and all the tribunal work that we do. But I think I really turned a corner back in 2010 when I did my training as a mediator. Now, my business case was um, to be more equipped and more up to speed with what mediation involves, still to act as a representative of clients like yourselves in mediation rather than actually act as the mediator. But it was an incredibly intense training and I learned a huge amount, not just on mediation, but also negotiation um, from that training. Um, why I think this is more topical than ever um, and why we chose to present on this in our top tip session today is that there is a huge backlog, as you might imagine, within the Employment Tribunal Service and indeed the court service as a result of the COVID lockdown situation. Um, so gradually the courts and the tribunals are, are, are awakening. They're using technology platforms such as this to have virtual hearings. Um, so they are adapting and they are moving with the times um, to cope with lockdown and social distancing and such like. Um, but in the time of COVID, if you like, I think we have seen mediation really come into the fore and to be used as a, as a, a response and as an alternative to litigation more than ever before. And there's a number of moves and, and movements, if you like, calling upon the court system. Uh, we, in fact, at Burness Paul put our name to that. I'll share a link to it at the end of this session. But movements calling upon Scottish government, calling upon uh, uh, on, on industry and calling on the 
court service really to embrace mediation to help with this COVID backlog of disputes. Um, within the Employment Tribunal Service, again, we have the judicial mediation system already. So the Tribunal Service a few years back um, took, took forward and actually embraced mediation. It doesn't happen in every case, far from it, and certain cases lend itself better than others, particularly those involving, say, discrimination or multi-day hearings. So judicial mediation uh, invariably will be an option um, in the Tribunal Service, and that's something I think we'll see more of for the reasons that um, we're going to talk about. Uh, and, and really within our own team of, of lawyers at Burness Paul here, uh, we are regularly reaching for mediation within our toolkit as employment lawyers. Um, it's I, I genuinely would say that I can think of very few, if any, cases that we don't at least consider mediation for. Now, I'm not saying we're rushing to mediate every case we're involved in, but increasingly we are seeing mediation within the toolkit of our employment team. So against that background, um, I will uh, lead off on, on top 10 tips. OK, so first up, uh, number one is mediation works. Um, so mediation is successful. Um, statistics uh, regularly show in any studies that between 70 to 80 percent of cases that go to mediation settle. Um, and they settle either at mediation or again, you might see statistics that show uh, that the case settles within, say, two weeks after coming together in mediation and trying to thrash out the issues. Um, so first off, that's a technique I often use, certainly with parties to try and explain the benefits of mediation, the pros and cons. But one of them right up there is it's successful. It does work. Um, so coming into mediation, give it a go. Um, I sometimes say, what have you got to lose? And this could be said again if you're on the claimant side. What have you got to lose? You've still got your case. If the case doesn't settle at mediation, you can still go to tribunal. If your grievance doesn't resolve itself, you can still uh, raise it. We could pause it. If mediation doesn't work, we come back towards the grievance procedure. So, you know, looking at mutual gain, there's a win-win to be had. Give it a go. And mediators, similarly, I've seen a good technique they will use. Um, a mediation generally lasts a day. It's quite rare for it to take longer than a day, but um, generally you'll have a day. And a day could mean till midnight. A day could mean till 8 p.m. It can be a long day. And I'll talk about maybe what the, the kind of roadmap of mediation looks like. But mediators, as the, the energy starts to dip, you know, usually it's mid-afternoon and you feel like you're you're kind of uh, wading through treacle. A mediator will say, listen, this is successful. 70 to 80 percent of these cases do settle. You've come here today. Give it a go. Keep working hard on it. You can leave any time. But listen, we're here. Why not keep working through this? So I, I think that um, statistic is, is helpful, you know, really just to get the businesses that you're advising on board that mediation does work. And um, it's certainly a credible option. My second tip then, tip number two, virtual mediation works. OK, now again, here we are living in COVID. And I'll be honest, at the start of COVID, I had a very contentious dispute, which was in the diary for mediation. OK, the mediation date was fixed in May and we had that fixed quite some time in the diary. It's been a long running dispute. And I honestly assumed, well, that's another date that's vacated like every holiday and like every birthday party. That mediation date, nah, that's not going to happen. That will be postponed. But we then looked at it a bit more and we thought, you know what, that's really frustrating. It's unfortunate. There was a momentum. We'd done the preparation for it and bang, uh, along comes lockdown. So we explored what else could we do? What other ways might we make mediation work? Uh, the mediator we had chosen was right up for it. Very um, advanced, very forward thinking and said, you know what? Maybe we can use an online platform for that. The chosen platform was Zoom. We felt that was the one that was most familiar by that point. We'd all had our Zoom uh, quizzes and our Zoom parties. So Zoom was a bit more familiar territory. And you know what? It absolutely worked. We kept the same date for the mediation. We used Zoom as the platform and it was amazing. I mean, I, I would actually say that it was as effective and in some respects even more so in aspects of the day of mediation. Because again, if you visualize a mediation day, we had booked a hotel for this particular one and we had five rooms assigned. We had one for the mediator, we had one for the, the, the party A, we had one for party uh, B, we had breakout rooms assigned. All of that was created, recreated in the virtual world of Zoom. The premium package that had to be uh, acquired, which the mediator did, and there were breakout rooms. 
and we physically moved each other over. So I was moved into a little breakout room with the other side's lawyer to have a bit of a spar at a particular point. The parties were moved into their own rooms. We were more flexible with who attended and that there were loved ones allowed. Um, the other half of one of the claimants was in one room and we just moved and then we came together when needed to. The, the mediator said his biggest fear, and thank goodness it didn't happen, was assigning with the, the mouse click the wrong person to pop up in the wrong breakout room. And you can imagine how that would have done as that face came up on your screen. So you have to be obviously very careful. But it was very similar to knocking on the door and walking from one room to the other, the private space, and then coming into the the, the kind of the, the main joint room if, if it came to it. Um, there was there were tears um there was intensity um just like in the real world and actually i found in in some senses more intense and i don't know if you would agree with this those of you uh, that have been working from home for so many months now you know these platforms zoom and teams and such like they can be quite draining can't they they can be quite intimate as we all look into each other's homes and each other's uh, uh new working spaces the same was said uh, I, I would say in mediation so in a sense even more so that you were in the zone with the other side when you were having a dialogue with them to try and get this dispute resolved. Um, so don't give up on mediation just because we're now working from home or we're not in the in the real world. I can attest and I can also tell you the case settled. So the case did resolve itself late in the day uh, in, in a virtual uh, platform. And off we went and, and dealt with the settlement agreement as we would in any other in any other mediation. So um, that's number two. On to number three. My tip number three is that workplace disputes particularly lend themselves well to mediation. Um, and the example I often give of this, I think when, when you think of a dispute um, that is most prevalent um, in mediation, I think in the world of, of the legal world, it tends to be matrimonial disputes, isn't it? You know, you think about a family law dispute, a divorce. It's the norm and it's been the norm for quite some time. The family lawyer uh, community has embraced mediation for years. And you know why? There's maybe children involved. There's horrible relationship issues. There's personal issues. There's emotion. There's hurt. There's anguish. So, of course, we now accept, don't we, that, well, matrimony disputes and mediation go hand in hand. My provocation is that the same applies for workplace disputes. And how about this? And maybe less so now, now that we're all working from home. But was there not a time in all of our careers when we would genuinely say, Do you know what? I spend more time at work with more ag than I do with my wife at home, with the kids. You know, we're all working together. We all put on a long shift. And rest assured that if that relationship at work, a um, bit inappropriate uh, term maybe, but that have you heard the term work wife, my work wife or my work husband, you know, people talk about that. They sit in the same open plan pod together. You know, they are close colleagues. If that close relationship with someone that you spend eight hours a day with breaks up, if that relationship falls apart, just like a marriage, that relationship can be toxic. It, that dispute can have entrenched positions. There can be hurt. There can be tears. There can be tantrums. All the things that make their way to your desk in, in the HR teams. So how do we deal with those disputes at work? Yep, what do we normally reach for? Back to my uh, HR toolkit analogy. You go in the, in the toolkit and you pull out what? The grievance procedure. That's what we all do, isn't it? That's the, that's the normal legal advice. I mean, I've even heard many a person say, including HR people, most experienced HR people say, I've just offered him the grievance procedure. There's our grievance procedure. You know, if you have a complaint, put in your grievance. Now, what then happens? You then get a 25 page grievance. You get a toxic grievance. What do you then do with it? Well, you find a manager and so it continues. Following that sequential grievance procedure, all that that in my general experience does is it polarizes positions. And I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of a grievance procedure. I'll say that. I don't think, how about this? I don't think grievance procedures resolve problems at work. And that's what they ought to do. What is a grievance? It's a problem. Let's why not use that word? Someone's got a problem at work with their job or with their manager or with their pay. Well, how do we resolve that problem? Ah, we pull out the grievance procedure. And how much time do we in the HR community, in the employment law uh, community do writing grievance outcomes, using euphemisms like, oh, there was a sense it may have been better handled, but I don't uphold your grievance. My recommendation might be, or we have insufficient evidence to uphold. 
So here we go. No one likes upholding grievances. Why? Because you don't want a discrimination claim after or a constructive dismissal and a resignation. So the, the binary approach to a grievance, there's two outcomes. I uphold it or I reject it. You know, what does that achieve? Does that really solve a problem? And for me, therefore, we have seen, I would say, as we've come through the journey and all of you that have joined the, 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 um, uh, the multiple workshops that Morag and Jen and others in the team have been putting on all through lockdown from furlough, from COVID, we've seen this almost anatomy of what's gone on in lockdown. And here we are post restructuring, post um, cost cutting. It's about anger now, I think, about people that are unhappy and that we're seeing a huge influx of grievances. That grievance culture, it's the, e it's the email warriors, the, 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 the keyboard terrorists behind the screen typing away capital letters and underlined and bold, all their anger and all their problems. So we're seeing grievances really on the up. And for me, therefore, increasingly, I'm saying to clients, do you know what? Why not reach for mediation instead? Is that not a more constructive and a more positive approach? And that's not to say it does it does away with the um, uh, the grievance procedure. You've still got that. That's paused. It's there. We can always come back to that. But why not try mediation as a positive enough and as a, as a forward thinking approach? Because otherwise, I think these grievances just get toxic and they fester and they get more polarized on positions. OK, so increasingly think about mediation. Some clients, a lot of the public sector have actually bespoke uh, mediation policies. Some large organizations have trained up a crack team of mediators from within their midst and shock horror, get some union reps trained up as well. You know, have a really trusted core of mediators that you can reach for before you go down the more adversarial grievance route. So, as I say, I think that's a, a real movement that we've seen, particularly in these difficult times. So tip number four, uh, tip number four, the mediator is not a judge or decision maker. And I think it's so important to remember that right from the start, because we're so used to, are we not looking at figures of authority, particularly judges, they're deciding, you know, people go quiet and they kind of uh, defer to the judge. And that's not the mediator. The mediator controls the process. The mediator is in charge, if you like, of the what the mediation looks like and how it works. But they're facilitators. They facilitate a negotiation. That's all mediation is. The dictionary definition, I'd say a good dictionary definition of mediation is a uh, facilitated negotiation. And it's an active role of the mediator, but importantly, he does not take a decision. OK, the parties are in control of it. How different is that to litigation? How often do you rightly ask us as your lawyers, are we going to win this case? What are our prospects? And we'll give you a view on that. But you're out of control. The minute you set foot in tribunal, you're out of control. You've lost that control and you have given that to the judge to decide. In mediation, you're still in control. The parties decide whether they settle at all. And if they do settle, how much for and what the terms of settlement are. So the mediator is unbiased. And I, I love a quote I once heard that, well, if they're biased, their bias is to settle. That's what you do see in some mediators. They are determined to get the case settled. They maybe like it for their stats and maybe they like that 70, 80 percent statistic to keep that up high. Um, but you know what? Fine. You're still in control. They don't determine what happens and they certainly don't judge you on the case. But. Remember, it is not a soft op option. I think in the early days when I um, and many in the legal community used to scoff at mediation, it was tree hugging, they called it tree hugging. What's this tree hugging stuff? We should be litigating. We should be fighting every case. Well, do you know what? It is not tree hugging. It is not for the faint hearted and it is not a soft option. Mediation is tough. Mediation is rigorous and you will be tested on it. You will rightly be reality checked on your case. You know, what do you really think this is about? We will be tested as your lawyers. What prospects have you given your client of success? How much is this going to cost them at, at, at tribunal if you ran it? So you've got to be ready for all of that. It is a tough process and a good mediator will probe and they will really put you on the on the spot there. But they won't judge. They won't judge you. They won't determine the outcome, but they will reality check and reality test. And beautifully, they will do the same in the other room. For every time they're in your room, they'll be testing that claimant as well. If we're on the respondent side, they'll be testing the claimant of whether they want to be in the witness box and whether they're telling the truth and whether they really think they're going to win their case. And if so, what they'll gain for it. OK, so the mediator is a powerful role and actually 
it's uh, having assisted mediators my goodness what they see is remarkable because when you know what goes on in your private room the mediator sees what goes on in that other private room he literally is that fly in the wall and it is fascinating to see what's going on in private in both different settings so that role is powerful but as i say tip number four they are not a judge or decision maker tip number five um keep an open mind going into mediation okay which is very different, I think, than the polarized position that you're used to taking when you advise a client or you in HR advise the business. We are wired, are we not, to give solutions and to give answers. What do you think I should do, Morag? What do you think we should do? Would you dismiss for that? What's the right outcome? You know, and that's what we do. That's, that's how we've been trained. We give answers and we advise. We take positions, don't we? How often do you hear that? And do we write this in, in outcome letters or in um, uh, legal correspondence? Uh, we say things like, my client's position is on behalf of my client, on behalf of the business, my outcome of this grievance is, I believe that, my opinion is. That's how we always are very fixed on our opinions and our views. And what I encourage you to do in mediation is think differently. You change that whole mindset as you go into mediation. Open your mind and keep your mind open. Ask yourself different questions. And for me, the best one, the one I like best, is what would success look like to you? What do I really need to achieve to resolve this dispute? Okay, what would the outcome, forward thinking, how do we move on from here? It's not about win and lose. It's not about polarized positions, about trying to find areas of mutual gain. And a lot of the time spent in medi mediation invariably is exploring, is asking questions, is being asked questions and trying to get to the nub of what the issue is. And talk about negotiation skills then. Um, we talk about positional bargaining, which is hard and, and traditional, what most of us do. I want to settle for five grand. I want to settle for a hundred thousand pounds. Nothing more than that. You know, that th this is the positions are very fixed. I'm right, you're wrong. And in mediation, we encourage what we call principled bargaining. So don't be fixed on positions, but instead look at interests. And if you look at the wider interests, often that can unlock the dispute. And often that's when you can find almost that Venn diagram, that coming together of mutual interest, that bit in the middle. And it's invariably in workplace disputes. It's not just about money. You know, we think about settlements, five grand, 10 grand, whatever. But so often our cases turn on, on, on interests, on wider interests, like I am worried about my reputation. I, I need to move on from this and get another job. I want an apology. How often have we heard that? I need him or her to say sorry costs nothing and increasingly we do that and you certainly can do it in mediation in a private and confidential bubble and um, i need to continue working and having a relationship with that organization and if that person's sacked we still need them to be a consultant say so these wider things that a tribunal will never give you a tribunal can never give you an apology nor can it ever preserve a working relationship if anything it's more likely to shatter it and a case that always resonated for me, I wrote a blog post, if you saw this a couple of years ago, about a senior exec that came to see me. And, and it, he was so focused on a little small bit of his contract of employment, something that just, you know, didn't feel right about flexible working. And that was an easy answer. I remember the legal answer was quite straightforward. But uh, my mediation training led me to say to him, what are you looking for? What does success look like? And he paused. There was this long pregnant pause. And his answer surprised me his words were i just want to stop feeling so angry and i want my wife to stop feeling so angry and again it just completely changed where we went with his case it wasn't i want money i want him or her sacked i want an apology he wanted that lifting feeling of anger released from him because we drilled into it he hated his job but he loved his career his career was everything to him and that took us down very much that path of trying to negotiate an exit for him so this is when we're acting on the other side of the fence i think we can see these insights so that that really that technique of what are you looking for what would success look like can be very very helpful in mediation so tip number six that really leads on from that that listening and that questioning tip number six put yourself in the other side's shoes so developing that question and reframing the question about success, what would success look like to the other side and what do they really need to hear from me to resolve this dispute? 
So look inwardly and ask yourself, where have I maybe made some mistakes? Ask the manager that we bring along to the mediation. Where might you have made some mistakes? What can you learn from that? What do they need to hear from you? What could you say that would help us get this dispute resolved? Is it an apology? Is it that we can move you to a different department? So what does the other side need to hear? And in mediation, again, what was liberating for me was this. How often do we as lawyers, we pick up our pens in tribunal, we bring our trainees along and they write down every single word of the evidence. But they only ever read it again. But in mediation, put the pen down. You don't want notes of mediation. It's confidential. It's without prejudice. Tear them up if it's not settled. Tear it up if it is settled, frankly, because you've got an, a, a settlement agreement instead. Um, so put the pen down and actively listen. And I mean actively listen. Watch. Look at the body language of your opponent. If you come together in a in a meeting, a joint meeting, if it's a, a dispute where relationships are not completely moribund, come together and watch what that individual says and ask yourself, what do I think I need to say? And I think for me, the most emotional example of that I've ever seen was the mediation was structured in a way that we would let both parties speak. So the mediator said, listen, you'll get five minutes each. We came into a joint room and it was a very heated and emotional one where we let the claimant go first and the claimant spoke. And he spoke and he listed, I counted them, I think 12 claims. He hadn't raised any yet, but he would raise. They were from constructive dismissal to race discrimination to data protection you name it and he was angry and his you know he was you could see the kind of lip quivering but the bit that really um caught my attention is he offloaded venting we call it he vented about what he'd been through at work was he said you know what the worst thing for me is that when my children google my name they see that i'm a poor performer and the reason was this was quite high profile and it had made some press attention. And that was the bit. And his lip just quivered at that point. I could see his eyes were glassing over. So we went back. So we paused. We let him speak, went back to our room. And we had to take stock as a group and say, how do we go back? Now, I could have gone back as the lawyer. And actually, one client encouraged me. You could go back, David, and say, "That's that. there's no jurisdiction on that claim or you're time barred. Or, you know, we could have gone back and defended it. But one of the witnesses that we chose, or representatives that we chose, who was who, who got this stuff, he thought differently. He and I said, did you see how he reacted when he mentioned his family? And wow, that was powerful. He was a macho character who suddenly changed. So what we did, we went back in the room and we opened by saying, thank you. And we let, the, this is the, 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 the client talking. Thank you for sharing that. That's the first that we really heard how you felt. And I'm sorry to see what impact that this dispute has had on you and those who you love. And that word love came out, it was remarkable. And I didn't rehearse that with the client, it just came out. And this man who was angry, who was entrenched, he nodded, didn't say because it was you, and he, you just saw him mouth the words, thank you. And it completely changed the day. Lever arch folders were there, they were put to one side and we moved forward. We moved forward for how we could resolve the dispute on the issues and on the finances and what have you. But we didn't need to dwell on all the terrible things that he was threatening claims about. So listening, that body language, watching, that was the key thing, I think, that unlocked the, the, the day and changed where that dispute went. Would never have happened in court. It would have been much more um, entrenched. So we're on to number seven, tip number seven, um, prepare thoroughly in advance of mediation. And again, this comes back to my point, I think about it not being a, a soft option because some of these disputes, take the example I just gave, if, if that had played out in, in tribunal or indeed if courts had been involved as well, it would have taken weeks. It would have taken weeks of evidence. It would have taken months of time to even get to the hearing and COVID obviously is uh, uh, the, the opening point I made about the backlog. And yet in mediation, as I mentioned, almost all mediations are done in a day. So what does that mean? It means you're distilling potentially days or weeks of evidence into one day. You're breaking that down. So for goodness sake, you need to prepare. You can't walk into mediation unprepared. You need as much to know about your case as you do as if you were in tribunal, particularly for us as your representatives, because we don't have our witnesses invariably. We certainly don't have multiple witnesses. There'll usually be a lawyer plus one representative. So you need to know the facts. You need to be ready to answer questions. As I mentioned, we have to be probed on, do we think we're gonna win and how much will it cost and all these quite challenging questions. 
So preparation is vital in mediation, albeit that uh, it's quite paper light. Uh, so paper light, by that I mean there's usually a short um, uh, position statement, an introduction that's made, and there might be some words that are spoken at the, the outset of the meeting. So we're not looking, the mediator does not want to wade through bundles of document like a judge would in tribunal. Okay, so it's more about being prepared in knowing your case and having the right people there to speak to that um, on behalf of the company's position if we're on the employer side. Tip number eight, and this is the bit where, when do we get this thing settled? When do we start talking money? Tip number eight, don't be afraid to make the first offer. And I'm back to my point, you're wading through treacle. It's now, what time is it? Two o'clock in the afternoon. Are we making an offer or not? And then you spend two or three hours sometime, well, I'm not making the first offer. They should go first. Or I made an offer two weeks ago or three months ago. It's their turn to make the first move. And you can spend hours or, or you often have like little mini mediations, uh, you know, within your own private room about whether to make the first offer. And it all goes round in circles. So uh, research has shown that there is often what we call a first mover advantage. Um, and that's a term, a, a negotiating technique called anchoring. If you've come across that, your studies in negotiation, anchoring. And studies have shown that the party that makes the first offer in a negotiation is often happier with the final settlement reached. OK, so if you can anchor that first offer closest to where you want to get to on either side of the fence, Oftentimes, it shows that you will end up happier with the final outcome. Because let's play it out differently. Let's say you are on the company side. I'm not making an offer. Let the claimant make the first move. What's going to happen? You're going to push and push and push. And all the claimant's going to do is they're going to ask for lots of money. And their first offer will be a year's pay, 18 months pay. And you're going to scoff at that and say that's outrageous and that's terrible. But see, when you make your next move, are you going to start really low or are you going to pull it closer to their anchor? You're probably going to be closer. You're probably going to say in your private room, geez, oh, she's wanting 12 months. Well, there's no point as offering 500 quid, is there? So you might offer three months. You might offer two months. But if you'd made the first move, you could have anchored it to your position by making a smaller offer. So sometimes go first. There's no harm in doing that. And don't, as I say, get too caught up on it. Let's be more focused on the issues rather than positions. Number nine, um, this might be surprising when you see what I've just been doing. Don't leave it to the lawyers to do all the talking. <laughs> as more I knows I can talk, I have to be quiet in mediation. And it's important for that. This isn't the type of forum where we will speak on your behalf and make your eloquent submissions. The mediator, but more importantly, the other side, they want to hear from you. So if I take my example about that powerful language used by my uh, HR client who said he was impressed about how this had impacted on those that loved this claimant. My word, that was incredibly emotional. And it really, as I say, had a bearing on how the day went. So it's important to hear from the individuals. Um, I sat with a client once um, in a mediation. There was a trade union on the other side. We had our private room, of course. It was a judicial mediation. And as, as the uh, judge mediator walked into our private room, my HR director was swearing and was angry and was, was shouting. She'd raised her voice. And she went, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. I'm so sorry. And he said, listen, don't apologize to me. Say whatever you want. You know, this is your private room. If you're angry and you're emotional, bang the table and say that because it was hard. And she felt angry about what she'd heard in the previous session. Um, so, you know, this is perfectly appropriate. Vent, get things off your chest. Um, and I think that's why the statistic I mentioned earlier about cases that don't settle at mediation, why so many settle two weeks after. Because once you've said it, once you've got it off your chest and shouted and cried and, and called names and sworn and whatever, once you've done that, you then go home and you think, geez, oh, do I actually need a tribunal now to sit in the witness box under oath and have a lawyer question me? No, do you know what? I've, I've actually, that meeting, when I managed to say, like, look in the whites of the eyes of my boss and tell him what he's done to me and what he's done to my family life because of the bullying, I've actually done that. You know, I've got that off my chest. Right now, what do I do? Let's get this thing settled. Is it cash or is it a change to another department or, or something like that? Um, so venting is key there. Um, but as I say, don't leave it to your lawyer to do the talking. And importantly, of course, that's for us as a HR and a legal team to decide who do we bring along? 
Okay, not everyone gets this stuff, and you could probably guess within your own teams, nah, he or she would not be right for mediation. They would not say the right thing or wouldn't get to, th you know, back to my, my, my tip about thinking differently. So it is important to choose who comes along. Okay, uh, tip number 10, my final tip of the, of, of the afternoon. Um, I quote from a literary um, uh, legend, George Bernard Shaw. He said, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. I love that quote. Um, disputes often arise, don't they, particularly at work because of miscommunication. And sometimes the biggest miscommunication is the belief that it's happened when it hasn't happened at all, where people think, oh, yeah, he knows about that. She knows our view on that. But people haven't spoken. They've actually not communicated at all or they have picked up on the wrong intonation or a, an email that was taken the wrong way. So what does mediation give you? It gives you a safe place to talk and it's good to talk isn't it it's a safe space it's without prejudice it's private it's confidential and that's a major advantage is it not of mediation rather than it all being played out in public uh, in tribunal so as i say come together talk to the other side listen importantly to what they say active listening and think about what your opponent needs to hear and i think my favorite tip from my mediation training was this one which is write your opponent's victory speech i love that you know what do they need to hear what would it take for them to leave this day of mediation to go home to their husband or wife and say i won i got a result I got 30 grand, I got an apology, I'm over the moon with that, I can move on now, I can leave that organization, I can get that new job I was talking to. You know, so with that, write their victory speech for them. Think about what they need to say and for goodness sake, make it happen. And you know what, if it's an apology, suck it up, give the apology, because if it gets that case settled and you've saved yourself 100 grand or 10 days of tribunal, it may well be worth it. So there we are, a lot to take in, I know, folks, but I do hope that you've got some uh, some nuggets um, on those top 10 tips, uh, which we'll feature in our uh, written briefing uh, that will follow thereafter. And I will end just by giving you a link to the, um, the call to action, as we called it, uh, the call to action that we uh, put our names to with another number of other business leaders on really inviting those in society, those in, uh, in, in government and in the judiciary to embrace mediation as a genuine alternative to, to litigation. Brilliant. Thanks so much, David. That, that was really interesting. I'm, I'm sitting there thinking I've got a case just now where I've just had a grievance put in. I think we'll absolutely uh, refer to mediation as quick as we can on that one because I, 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 I many of you will experience this. I'm sure when you get that mediation in and you try to kind of have that written communication verbal communication where you're offering support and all the rest of it but it does very quickly people do very quickly become polarized and it is difficult to rescue that um the only other thing i was going to say on mediation is my first experience of mediation very briefly because i'm conscious of time um it, it's a it's an emotional roller coaster isn't it because you you know you go through the day and you're like oh we're getting there and then you can feel like you're not getting anywhere then it's a high and low and the first one i did it was acting for an individual and we got to a place where we thought we were going to agree a deal and he phoned his wife and said to his wife, this is what I'm thinking. And she said, there's no way you should accept that. And the whole thing was blown off course. And what really hit for me there was him and I had been through that emotional journey. We'd understood everything that had happened that day, whereas his wife hadn't been part of it. And so was just saying, so it's a defeat. And it really made me think about in future mediations, particularly if I'm acting for an individual, but I suppose even when I'm acting for the employer, I may encourage the individual to bring their important other, whoever that may be with them, so that they've also been through that journey. Um, and it doesn't all get scuppered right at the last minute in that way. That was a huge learning exercise for me. But um, yeah, and thank you for that. Very briefly then, thank you everyone for joining the session today. I hope you found it helpful. As always, we'll circulate the recording next week. We'll also circulate the bulletin that covers all of the cases we've spoken about and David's top 10 tips. Um, if you're not on our database and you want to receive that bulletin, please just drop us an email and we'll make sure we add you onto the database so you receive all the bulletins as, as they come out. And as always, if there's anything we can help with, then you know, do get in touch. Um, but otherwise, I hope you have a lovely afternoon and take care and we'll see you again next time. Bye for now.